How many know we live in a self-centered society today? Amen. All right, if you didn't say amen there, I don't know if you'll say amen on the next part of this phrase. And it rubs off on us sometimes. Oh, okay, all right. Being real. And uh, we sometimes could forget that Christians are bonded together in a relationship of unity as members of one another. And today I want to talk about, in our Kingdom series, Kingdom and Church Unity. And um, once again, your pastor is way over his head in the challenge for today. And it's going to take the Holy Spirit to make this become alive in our hearts. And I pray that this message will um, challenge you as it has me greatly in my life. And I believe it's just what the doctor ordered. Dr. Jesus has ordered for our lives. And uh, Paul says to the church in Rome, in Romans 12, 5, So it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we belong to each other. If we're a part of the body of Christ, we belong to each other. Those are strong words, aren't they? God takes this relationship so serious that the Bible warns us to watch out for people who cause division in the church because they're harming Christ's body. Amen. Ephesians 4.3 says, Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. Make every effort. Why, why would he say that? Make every effort because... Because if we're not making an effort, we're probably not going to be unified. We're going to, we're going to, well, see, I want to say that I'm preaching this message today at a good time because I don't know of anybody that has an end game of destroying this house of God. I don't know of anybody in this place right here this morning that has come here with the, with the decision, I am going to tear this place apart. In fact, a lot of people that are sometimes destructive don't even have an end game. They don't know where they're going. They're just, you know, they're just miserable. One of our elders told me this morning that um, the uh, blood type of a pessimist is a B negative. <laughs> and uh, sometimes, sometimes, you know, we don't have an end game, you know. And we think, well, boy, I'm glad this message isn't for me because I'm not going to destroy the body of Christ that I recognize this church, this house, this local representation is representation of his body. And I don't want to cause it no harm. I'm, I'm not messing with anything, you know. But then sometimes we do because we, we gossip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's destructive. Or, or we murmur, complain. Does anybody ever complain in ways that are not helpful? No. Boy, see how quiet it got? Just like that, just like that. Because we think of this big thing, but how many know the enemy tries to tear apart a church like ours in little ways? He's like creeping paralysis. You know what creeping paralysis is, don't you? It, that it means that a person don't even know they got it. It gets a little hold on this part of their body and a little bit of hold over here and a little bit over here. And all of a sudden, before they realize it, it's got them. And that's the way the devil likes to work in our lives. He likes to creep into our lives. And he likes for his plan to begin to creep out of us in, the, in little ways because we're not making every effort to keep ourselves united in the Spirit, binding ourselves together with peace. Our individual benefits come with shared responsibility. This means that all of us need to make a contribution to one another. All of us need to make a contribution to each other. We all have gifts and talents that the rest of the body needs. Have you ever had family members that were freeloaders, moochers? Just keep smiling. I won't know who you are. You know, and, and they, they like to enjoy the benefits of the family, but they don't want to do their part sometimes. Right? Okay, I'll get back to my notes. Number one, let's talk about church unity is spiritual and living. Church unity is spiritual and living. The Bible teaches us that the unity of the Lord's church is the Holy Spirit's ministry. 
Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 13. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free, but we've all been baptized into one body by one spirit. We all share the same spirit. So in other words, in other words, Church unity is, a, is spiritual and it's living, meaning that the body of Christ here at Calvary, we have to see this, is we're his body and we make up many parts, but we are one body. And, and when we make up one body, we're living, we're alive, we're making a difference. If you take this body and we allow Satan to divide us and we take you know, somebody's body and we cut out their heart and put it over here and we cut out their gizzard. Or we don't have a gizzard, that's a chicken. And we cut out the liver and we put it over here and, and, and we cut off other parts of the body and set them over there. How many know they're all there, the parts are all there, there's no life. There's no life anymore. We have to be united. We have to come together. We each have to play our part, you know. There's eyes, there's nose, there's ears, right? We all have our gifts in the body of Christ. There's armpits. Just thought I'd say that. There's a few armpits too. Two of them usually. And they serve a purpose. You're right, right. You know the thing about armpits is, you know what it is, right? They're like opinions. Everybody has at least two of them. And usually they both stink. Okay, that was just a thought. That was for free. So let me go to the first point about living. Church unity is spiritual in living. Letter A, oneness versus sameness. I need to talk about this just for a moment. The word unity means oneness, but that is different than sameness. How many know we're not all the same, but we're as the body of Christ, we're to be one? That's different. The church suffers when some try to make others conform to their standards and keep their list of do's and don'ts. The unity of the Spirit does not deny our individual uniqueness as people made in God's image. It would be boring if God made all of us just alike. I want to tell you, there is only one you. You're a one of a kind. There's only one me. You know, I, I would make a terrible Pastor Jeffrey Duncan. I'd make a terrible Pastor Glenn Gustafson. Thank God we have Glenn. I'm so grateful. But there's nobody like you. And if I tried to be you, I wouldn't do very good. Because I'm not you. On the other hand, I make the best Tim Bowman God ever made. Right? But we wouldn't want another one. Amen. Well, you missed a chance right there, I'll tell you. So God gives different gifts to each of us. Why? So the body of Christ can be much more productive and even challenging. True unity is finding oneness of purpose and commitment and moving toward a common mission despite our differences. In fact, if we do this right, our differences should make us better, should allow us to be more accountable to each other, give us different perspectives. When we come together under the bond of peace in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and keep Jesus at the center, then our differences actually can make us better. But Satan likes to warp that and divide us and make our differences tear us apart. It's just like marriages. Oh, I'm so thankful I didn't marry a Tim Bowman. I needed a Kathy. A Kathy Irene Steinmates. And Kathy Irene Steinmates, honey, whether you know it or not, needed a Tim Bowman in your life. <laughs> Look at her smile over there. to complete one another, to walk together in the joy of the Lord. 
I didn't need to marry someone like me. I need to marry someone that we could be one together for the cause of Jesus Christ. And marriages have to learn how to allow their differences to make them better, not tear them apart. This is what needs to happen in the body of Christ. Unity does not require that we're all the same, but that we're going in the same direction. Paul spent the rest of 1 Corinthians showing how the church's unity functions in the midst of our differences. Let me just read it real quick. Verse 19, how strange a body would be if it only had one part. Wouldn't that be weird? If you were just sitting there and you only had a nose. Wouldn't that be weird? And you're just sitting there, there's your nose. That's all there was. Oh my, I have terrible thoughts that come through my head. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among their members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. Our church has many people from different lifestyles and backgrounds and past. When I look around this congregation right here, and I just do a scan here. I see people from all walks of life, from different backgrounds, from different cultures, from different past. And, and God has bound us together in the spirit, in his body, in the spirit of unity. That's his plan. Somebody said, well, I don't like his plan. Well, you don't get to decide and I don't either. He, he, that's his plan. His church giving him glory, unified together. That's the Lord's plan, and he don't have plan B. And he's coming after a church that is unified together, working together for the cause of Jesus Christ in the earth. And we get to decide, are we going to be a part of that or not? You've heard the old saying that oil and water do not mix. Anybody heard that saying? Well, oil and water just don't mix. That's true unless something else is brought into the mix. Thankfully, somebody found a way to bring them together to make mayonnaise. Woohoo! Wow! Today we have mayonnaise because somebody found a way to bring oil and water together. Hamburgers would not be the same if it wasn't for this guy who found a way to bring them together and make mayonnaise. Now, I know we have disunity when it comes to Miracle Whip or Hellman's. Hellman's. Hellman's over here. (laughs) See? See? The devil's already working already. (laughs) So for that oil and that water to mix, they needed an emulsifier. An ingredient that can reach out to the water and reach out to the oil and bind them together so they don't go their own ways. And that ingredient in mayonnaise, that emulsifier that brings the oil and water together is called eggs. Eggs. Oh, isn't this spiritual? (laughs) You see, when the Holy Spirit takes over, People of different backgrounds and classes and personalities and interests begin to treat each other like family. The Holy Spirit is the divine emulsifier binding together different people to the family of God. Wow, isn't that great? So the second thing I want to bring to your attention is that Jesus prayed for unity. Jesus prayed for unity. He prayed this in John 17, 11, and then verses 20 through 23, he said, Now I am departing from the world. They are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are united. Did you catch that? 
that the Lord is praying that we would be united like him and the Father are united. All of a sudden, you know what I started realizing in studying for this message? This is a big deal. This is very, very important. And we read in verse 20, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's us. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. Not same, one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be as one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Why? So the world will know. Why does God want us to be one, unified together? So the world will know that God sent his son Jesus to die for us. To give us eternal life. This prayer shows how much is at stake in the church's unity. God's name is at stake. His glory and his love is tied to how his people live together in unity. All of a sudden, folks, here's what I realize. I gotta watch my mouth. I gotta watch my heart. I gotta watch the thought life about how I care for you and how I love you and how I see you as one, as the Father, that we're to be one like the Father and Jesus are one. I gotta be careful. I, I can't let little things trip me up. Does anybody besides me let little things trip you up sometimes? All of a sudden, in light of these passages, man, it is not worth it. I got to forgive. I got to let it go. Walk away. Challenge when I need to. When I'm in right relationship, meet, work it out, work through it. What I can't do is divide. I cannot bring, I have to take personal responsibility that me bringing division to this house of God is not going to happen by the grace of God. Does that mean we agree with each other all the time? No. no. But how we disagree becomes important. I've had to learn that a lot of people that come over my lifetime in pastoring don't always want really my thoughts and what God's put in my heart for the, to say to them, to help them, to counsel them, to love them. I've learned the hard way. Some people want that. A lot of people just want to tell me what they believe, and they, they don't want me to challenge them. They want me to just agree with them. And I wish they would have told me that up front. <laughs> they didn't want, they come telling me, Pastor, I need your counsel. No, you don't. You want me to agree with you. You see, real godly love means we work together, we pray together, we challenge one another. Some people don't want that kind of love. Did you know that? Some people don't want to be loved that way. They want to be, as we call it around here, they don't want to be loved, a godly love. They want to be left alone. I learned that after the 473rd time when people come in and would talk to me, and, and I realized they're really not asking for my thoughts on this. They just want to tell me what they're planning on doing and say, isn't that right, Pastor? I'm going to fall off the stage here. All right. I'm sure you enjoyed that on Facebook. So, we're to be a testimony to the world that the Lord and the faith we preach are real. God will respond to us on the basis of unity or the lack thereof. If we have time to be blessed but no time to be a blessing, that ought to be a signal to us. Hey, if you're here today and you say, well, I just don't have time to serve the church in any way, shape, or form. I don't have, I don't have time to do something once in a while. I don't have time to, to find somewhere where there needs to be some help and jump in there and help. You're too busy. I would just say in God's economy, in eternity, in all that God wants to do in and through our lives as a body of believers, 
If you're too busy to serve, too busy to be a part of this family, too busy to socialize and have people in your home or go to their home and get to know a few people, you can't know everybody around here, but you can know a few. You're too busy. Change it. Oh, you don't know, Pat. I know. Oh, yes, I do know. I, Kathy and I have learned we have to make, make time to do what God's called us to do because the enemy wants us to suck up all of our time doing busy things that don't have any eternal value. Now, no one else has that problem but me, probably. Huh. If we have time to be blessed but no time to be a blessing, that's a signal to us. We need to pay attention to the Lord's body. If we want benefits from the church but do not want to be a functioning member of a local church, that's a signal to us. Again, I apologize for Calvary for many years. We're not that today. God's changing us. But that mega church mindset where, you know, you get to come and take of a big platter of all kinds of offerings and a smorgasbord of ministry, but, but not much investment. And you come, and, and when it's convenient, you come and take and, and leave. That's not who we're trying to be. And, if, and I love you, but if you're new around here, please don't come in here and trying to change what God's taking the culture of this church we believe that we are to be a Christian family serving God by serving one another and caring about each other. Well, pastor, you may not grow as big if you have that mindset. And I say, so be it. Amen. Amen. Trying to grow and put more people in seats is not my job. Our job is to minister to one another. Only God can make things grow. God will decide what size we're to be. That, that is really not an indicator of how successful we are according to God's standards. What are we doing with what we have? How are we loving and caring for each other? And then God decides to grow his church. You see, i got to tell you, there are small communities in, in, in this Midwest that are serving God and loving their people, and there are small farm communities with 60 and 70 people, but they're teaching the truth, and they're raising their babies to love the Lord, and we need all of those churches that are willing to do that out there, doing their job. Right? So... If we're causing disruptions in the church by our attitudes or by our loose tongue, that's a signal. We'd better repent and seek the Lord's plan for how we live our lives. Aren't you glad? I mean, we got to watch that loose tongue. That, that tongue will get away from us. That runaway tongue will try to get away from all of us at times, right? Thank God. Aren't you glad God only gave us one tongue? <laughs> wow, I know a few people that had been a one tongue is a lot, man, to deal with with them, but can you, if they had five, I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> Here's what the Bible says about those kinds of folks. Let me read it to you in Romans 16, 17 through 18. And now I make one more appeal, my dear brothers and sisters, watch out for people, watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you've been taught. Stay away from them. Did you know that was in the Bible? Stay away from them. Such people are not serving Christ our Lord. They are serving their own personal interest. Paul also said in 1 Corinthians 3, 17, God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Wow. We're that temple. Do we remember one of the things God hates? It's found in Proverbs 6, 19. He hates a false witness who pours out lies, a person who sows discord in a family. And we've all been taught that, you know, and I've said it for years, well, God loves the sinner and hates the sin. And then I began to read my Bible one day, and I understood all through the Bible, there were, there were not only things God hates, there were people God hates. And I'm like, whoa, that hurt me at first. Like, God is love. He is love. And inside his love, who is love, 
There are people and things he hates. That messed with me. I had somebody leave our church one time when I said that because it hurt them so bad. And then I, they finally talked to me and I took them to all the scriptures and showed them. And it was tough on them because we bought into this idea. He hates a sower of discord. I'm like, Lord, I repent of any discord I've sowed in my life, in my family, in my church family. This is a big deal to God. In studying for this message, it became profound to me that unity is no small issue. Thirdly, the power of our unity. You see, because we, we all have struggles and challenges. Hey, in case you're new, this church is not perfect. There are problems here. There are challenges here. There are people here, and with people comes challenges. Somebody told me one time, they came to our church as a guest and said, I have the ministry of fault finding. I'm like, wouldn't that be a terrible ministry? I have the ministry of fault finding. And I said, well, you're sure going to have a great time here. God didn't call us to a ministry of fault finding. He called us to reconciliation. He called us to redemption. He called us to truth and honesty, but for the purpose of not finding fault, but to bring glory to our great God. Jesus told the disciples not to go anywhere or do anything until the Holy Spirit came. So they went into this upper room to be one-minded and devoted themselves to prayer, the Bible says. And in Acts 1.14, they all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. They were all on the same page, united together, and the Spirit came in power at Pentecost. And on that day, 3,000 people were saved in one day, Acts 2.41, because of the unity of of the power of God that brought the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, to, that, to those people in that upper room. And then it began to flood, and it's made its way to us today. Yes, we must have individual faith in Christ to go to heaven someday, but it takes more than us by ourselves to get some heaven down here on earth. And I don't know about you, but I'd like to, get, I'd like to not wait for heaven to go to heaven, I'd like to bring some heaven to the earth. I'd like to see some heaven, more heaven operating in my family, more heaven operating in my life. What is it going to take to see what Jesus prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? How is that going to happen? Well, he saves us personally and guarantees us an eternal home. But what brings heaven to earth is the unity of his body. When God's people work together, we can, we can see more of God's working power or we can hinder it in our personal lives through disobedience. The early church understood the power of the unified body. Let me give you one example before we move on. In Acts 4, 18 through 22, I'll give you one example. As the council of the Jewish religious people were coming against the apostles, and they said so. They called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. Why? For everyone was praising God. There we go. The unity of the people of God came together and they were all praising God. And the devil got scared and took off. We can put the enemy on the run when we come together and pray, praise and worship to our God and unify our hearts together around the cause of Christ. Fourth thing, the importance of racial unity. Acts 17, 26, from one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. 
Because we all share a common origin in Adam, any division predicated on race is illegitimate. Racial separation in our society and in God's church came about as a result of departing from this biblical truth. Man-made ideas created a divide between cultures that has created the mess that we see in our world today. It is a sad mess. But we know this does not belong in God's true church. And just in case you haven't heard it around here, we believe that spiritually we've become one race in Jesus Christ. The cross brings black and white and brown and yellow all together as one spiritual race. But in this earth, there are different cultures. There are different backgrounds. We all have different pasts. And what brings us together is Jesus. And I want you to know, just in case you hadn't heard it, we know that there is critical race theory out here in the world. We know there is wokeness out here in this world being taught and shared and all this. But, but we as a believer, in case you're new and you deserve to know this up front, we don't believe that that belongs in the house of God. There is no place for it here. We are one in Jesus Christ. The only thing that will repair this divide is a return to biblical truth as our only standard. To do this, here's what we have to answer this question. Who's in charge? Who's in charge? Is God and the Bible in charge of our lives? Is God and the Bible shaping our thoughts and our patterns and how we live life? Is it, who's in charge? Is it God and the Bible? Is it so-called science? Have you ever heard lately, follow the science? I've been trying to follow the science and it's led me in 14 circles and I can't figure out which way I'm going. <laughs> follow the science, I'm trying, I can't figure it out. Or who's in charge, God in the Bible, science, somebody's culture? Oh, maybe your culture, your upbringing, your past, your color, that's who's in charge. Who's in charge? In spite of our successes in America as it relates to science, education, medicine, and technology, becoming one nation under God continues to elude America. So let me talk the fourth thing, the importance of racial unity. In Acts 17, 26, we talked about one man being created and all the nations came from him. And I want to tell you, this, this challenge, this racial strife is happening too much in the church. L let me just say this. May that never be us. There, there may be, as I'm preaching here today, pockets of things that God will put in your heart where you need to deal with it. But as a church, may that never be us. If God's people will get this biblical unity right as it relates to our importance of being one in Christ, our impact will be far greater in the world because our testimony will be great. Here's a verse to consider before I move on. Ephesians 3.10. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom and its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now I want to switch gears in this message. So just take a break for a second. Breathe. This is your intermission. You get 10 seconds. This is your intermission. I'm going to switch gears totally, and I'm going to move to a whole different topic that is going to be the practical part of this message. Hear the rain. Praise God for rain. We need it. We need spiritual rain too. And I want to switch this message and get to the practical part. This is the part we got to take home and work on, okay? And I'm going to use a Bible story. Are you all doing good? Yes. All right, so here we go. As quickly as I can, let me lay a little context, a foundation for the Bible story that I'm going to use. In 722 B.C., the Jews living in the northern kingdom called Israel were taken captive by the Assyrians. Now, this will just take a moment. An interracial exchange followed. Some Jews were deported to Assyria, and some Assyrians were deported to Israel. This is 722 years before Jesus. 
The Jews who remained did not entirely relinquish their true worship of God. Despite the introduction of, of the Assyrians and all the cults that they brought with them, intermarriage began to give birth to a new ethnic group of people called the Samaritans. And during the Persian period, the Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem to build the temple and the walls. And this attempt was resisted by the Samaritans, the mixed race of Assyrians and Israelites, who did not want to see Jerusalem success successfully rebuilt because of their racial hatred of the Jews. If you want to know more about it, read the book of Nehemiah. The Jews, meanwhile, desired to maintain the purity of the Jewish race and would not allow the Samaritans to participate in the rebuilding. A feud develops that has continued all the way from 722 B.C. to the time that Jesus is walking on the earth. This feud, talk about a family feud, 722 years. And serves as the historical backdrop to the encounter Jesus has with this Samaritan woman. Some of you are very familiar with the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus is traveling with his disciples through Samaria. He was not willing to take a shorter route. In other words, most, most of the traditional Jews or the Orthodox Jews, if you will, did not want to even come close to the Samaritans. They were like, eh. and they would, when they were on their way through the journeys that they would take, they would have to take the, the shortest route was to go through Samaria. It saved them a lot of time and days of travel, but they would go all the way around to avoid the Samaritans. And Jesus says, nope, we're going through Samaria to his disciples. They're not taking the long way around. And Jesus was sending a message to those around him that he was willing to go beyond his own culture to meet others' needs. And overcoming the cultural prejudice of the Samaritans was this other issue. And Jesus now is willing to make the first move in getting them to connect with him. And here's the first principle in the spiritual unity. This is the part I want you to take home. First, recognize common ground. In Samaria, Jesus rested at Jacob's well. A well in those days offered water and shade. It was a place for hot and tired people to stop. And Jesus chose this well because both Jews and Samaritans loved Jacob's well. This well was called Jacob's well. Jacob, forefathers, had dug this well. He was the father of both groups, loved by both groups. And Jesus is looking for common ground, so he stopped there. He builds this bridge of communication by starting with what he and the Samaritan woman have in common. The well. Jacob and thirst. And Jesus had rejected the attitudes of his contemporaries in his willingness to go through Samaria. And that's why we read in John 4, 9, this woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. Jesus said to Jesus, you are a Jew. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Do you all get this? Listen, listen. To put his Jewish lips on her Samaritan cup was an act of fellowship and warm acceptance. This was not done in her neighborhood. And, and I'll say this, this was not done in Jesus' neighborhood either. This act gave her value in that culture. Jesus was letting her know that he had a need and she was in a position to meet it. But how did the woman know Jesus was a, do, uh, was a Jew? How, how did she know? We don't see where John told, told her. I believe Jesus looked like a Jew. There was something that gave an indication of his racial and cultural heritage. Jesus did not give up his own earthly culture or race. He did not stop being a Jew to reach a Samaritan. But neither did he allow his culture and race to prevent him from connecting and meeting her spiritual need. Jesus meets this woman on common ground, a well. In fact, here's Jesus, who he says, if you'll drink the waters I give, you'll never thirst again. How many know Jesus was the well that never runs dry? Amen? 
The well, when you drink of him, how many know we're going to live forever? That, that means we're going to live for eternity. That's, that's water that means we'll never die. And she's like, wow, I want some of that water, right? Here's Jesus that well. I got this picture in my mind. Here's Jesus sitting on Jacob's well. Here's a well sitting on a well. Here's a well sitting on a well talking to this Samaritan woman, a woman of a different race, a different culture, a different background, different mindset, different views. And Jesus builds a bridge, gives her dignity, and she has something that he doesn't have in the natural. And she gives him a drink of her water. And he gives her a drink of his water. That's what happens when God brings his people together. So much to say and I'm running out of time. Could I have two more hours? <laughs> five more minutes. Maybe five minutes. I don't know if I can do this. This is becoming a problem for your pastor. Let me go to the second one. I'm going to skip over three pages. Here we go. I'm going to bring this to a landing. Will you stay with me while I bring it to a landing? Promise? Most of you. Okay, second principle of spiritual unity. Refuse to allow culture to interfere with truth. John 4, 19 and 20. Sir, the woman said you must be a prophet, so tell me why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship. Let me put that in today's language. Jesus, you all go to church over there, and we all go to church over here. You worship that way, and we worship that way. We're different. And Jesus responds to her in verse 22. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. Now, now, Watch out, because you're not going to take this verse right if you're like me. I did not get this verse for a long time. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. Salvation comes through the Jews because Jesus was a Jew. He addresses this because God had been brought into the discussion, and now there's a spiritual truth on the table, and we got to get this. Basically, Jesus was saying this, our differences are not wrong except when they produce the wrong information about God. We can all have some differences. We can all have different culture, different race, racial backgrounds. We can all have different past. And that's okay as long as they never produce the wrong information about who God is and what his plan is for our lives, and how he desires to bring us together. If it, if it gets in the way, if our differences get in the way of God's people coming together, we missed it. One thing we as brothers and sisters in the Lord must understand is that many of us have chosen to pay more attention. Let me just say this, okay, because here we are. We decided sometimes to pay more attention to our grandpas and our grandmas and our culture and our religious views than we've paid attention to our Heavenly Father. We sometimes hold a stronger commitment to the history of our family culture or the religion we grew up in than to the person of Jesus Christ. All right, I'm okay if you don't say amen. I'll, I'll live. So not to be cliche, not to be cliche, but the problem of race in America is not a problem of skin, it's a problem of sin. Our backgrounds and preferences are real, but when they overrule God, we're all wrong. Whenever there's a conflict between culture and God's truth, culture must submit to the truth of God as revealed in his word. Whenever we use words black and white and brown or yellow to define Christians, it could mean that we've changed Christianity to make it fit a cultural description. Christianity must always inform, explain, and if necessary, change our, culture, our cultural bias. Never the reverse. So the third principle of spiritual unity, it goes both ways. 
Jesus not only critiqued the Samaritan culture by the truth of God's word, he critiqued his own culture. So I want you to hear, I'm a white guy up here. But there is room for improvement in America in whites and blacks and browns and yellows and every race. We all have to not only look at others, we must begin to start looking inside. I'm going to end this message today with a little personal story of how God changed my life about this. And because Jesus dealt with his own culture, not only hers, she accepted it, became an evangelist, ran back into town, and masses of people came to Jesus. We find that in John 4, 39 through 42. And a great outreach happened because Jesus steps across this cultural line and engages. Do not misunderstand the point Jesus did not dispose of his Jewish passport, trim his beard, and adopt Samaritan slang. He gave us a model of the intentional nature and depth of his love in cross-cultural relationships. The great tragedy today is not so much our society is still divided. You know what the great tragedy of today is? that much of the church is divided. Now, this message is a little bit easier to preach to our church because I believe God's done a great work in our church and we, many pastors in the community tell us that we are the most multi-generational, multicultural church maybe in the Quad Cities. I don't even know if that's true, but I would be thankful for that if that's true. And I'm, I'm, I'm blessed by that. So here's how God worked on your pastor about this message. When my dad got saved, and I'm a little boy, I'm not little, I'm a young boy, I never was little. (laughs) We had in our family, which we didn't even understand or know, we had a lot of (coughs) racial biases. We were, in some ways, looking back, terrible. Terrible jokes, terrible ideas. I I would say this, in our own minds, we were better than other people sometimes. And we weren't. You ever heard that term, white trash? That was totally us. We were terrible. Rednecks. I don't even know what that means, but if there was such a thing, we were that. We were bad. And I come from a whole line of it. And somehow my dad truly got saved. And wouldn't you know, God put into the path of our family a black man that loved God with all of his heart. And he had all kind of racial problems. Him and his family struggled with white people. We struggle with black people, and now these two guys in a church come together in the bond of Christ and have this love for each other that they can't explain, and it's causing them to have to deal with it. (laughs) Isn't God something the way he works on things? And I'm telling you, it was strange because him and his wife and his kids would come to our home and we lived in a housing complex. Dad, we took bankruptcy. Dad got saved. We didn't have anything. My mom was always clean, but we lived in a place. In fact, the nickname of this place in Burlington, Iowa was, the nickname of the manor back then was Cockroach Haven. There was cockroaches. My mother hates cockroaches. My mother was always clean. We were dirt poor, but we always believed soap and water was cheap. And mom, mom scrubbed us till our skin turned red because she believed in clean. And my dad had a sister that he loved very deeply and 
she would get grossed out real easy. And Dad used to say, we don't have any cockroaches, but the neighbors on both sides do. And they come across to visit one another. And one day, Dad gets his sister, who doesn't know the Lord yet, to come over for dinner finally. And she says, Clayton, my dad's name was Clayton, Clayton, what's for supper tonight? And Dad says, get your fork, one will be by any moment. <laughs> and she left. She didn't stay for dinner. True story. These black family would come and the whole neighborhood would talk. Then our family, mom and dad, four kids, would go to their house and eat together and love each other and work through our differences and talk about it. And I'm a little kid being exposed for the first time in my little life to somebody of a different color, of a different race, of a different background. And they lived in a black neighborhood and everybody in their neighborhood talked about them white people going to see Mr. Jesse. And um, God knew that he needed to shape our family and my heart someday so that our church someday would be a church reaching out to the nations. Years passed, my dad moved to Florida, started a church. I grew up, cut my teeth in Florida in ministry. And the little, one of the daughters of Mr. Jesse, Esteem, grew up, called of God, is working in New York City, a place called Teen Challenge, seeing people's lives change for the glory of God. And she is ministering to a guy that's come through there who was an honor guard for President Nixon in the military, went to Vietnam, but grew up on the streets of Philadelphia, got back from Vietnam and lost his way, became a an heroin addict and lived on the streets and literally was shot and left for dead on the streets, a heroin addict. And somebody brought him to Teen Challenge. He got better. Jesus came into his heart. He began to go after God in incredible ways. A few years older than me, and I didn't know nothing about this at the time. I'm in Florida. He gets called into ministry, and God begins to do a marvelous work in this man's life. Esteem remembers our relationship. My dad's pastoring in Florida. They're looking for places to go and preach. And they call my dad, and after a couple of decades, our two worlds collide again. And this man that she married, and I'm going to just go to the end and, and let you all go pray. She, um, this guy, a few years older than me, becomes one of the greatest mentors in my life. He's black, I'm white. I tell you black and white because I can't even think of him as black and white. It don't even, it don't even register with me anymore. I, he just a man of God who poured into me. And here's the thing. He grew up on the streets of Philadelphia, went to Vietnam, honor guard for President Nixon, lived a crazy life. And here I am, a young boy growing up in a pastor's family after my dad got saved. And our two worlds in the natural were a million miles apart. And God brought us together. And my life is forever changed by a man named Bill Wilson, who became a mentor, who ended up starting a church in North Carolina. And 30 years after Vietnam, Hepatitis lay dormant in his body. He didn't even know he had it for 30 years and came back after 30 years and took his liver. And a few years ago, he died. And I got to go out and be a part of his memorial service. 
but because of love and unity, God brought people from two different parts of the world together and made this message so real in my heart. And folks, I wanna tell you, some people say they want unity, but socially, we don't engage with each other. I'm gonna just throw a little carrot out there, a little challenge. Now, if I force this, it's not authentic and it's terrible. I would encourage you to get people that are not like you exactly into your home and go to their home and watch God add his flavor to your life. It will open you up. It's allowed me to go to India four times and fall in love with the Indian people. And now we're planning, getting ready to plant our 54th church in India as a church body here, the people that need to eat. We need each other. Stand to your feet. We need each other. We need the Lord. God, I thank you for the unity of your spirit. I thank you for bringing your people together from every tribe and tongue, and every nationality and every race and every language. That the Jesus, the gospel brings us together as one body in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. You're dismissed. We love you in the Lord.